What's going on people of thing today we're gonna to be watching one this I saw this and this really interested me. I've been doing a lot of Irish videos lately, so you know. Uh this one is specifically on Irish Americans and this one is how Irish Americans became white. Finding your roots, you know, and that sounds really interesting. So welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and uh without keeping you here too long, let's go ahead and let YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what this is all about. The white skin made the Irish eligible for membership in the white race. It did not guarantee their admission. They had to earn it. The powers that be trying to pit groups against each other along racial lines. And if we don't recognize them as patterns, we're doomed to repeat them. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero, and I'm so glad that you're here with me again on my channel, where I explore questions of hidden history, ancestry, and genealogy. Today, I want to talk about the experience of Irish immigrants coming to America and how they went from being classified as barbarians to being white. My great-grandfather, John Donnelly, was the son of an Irish immigrant who was born in Belfast, Ireland, who came over to New York City in 1881. My great-grandfather, John Donnelly, a plane engineer, was sent to Monroe, Louisiana. While he was there working, he met my great-grandmother, Lola, and they got married. My Irish great-grandfather was a little bit of a renegade for his time. His own family rejected Lola for not being white. He married her anyway. The story of how the Irish became white in America is bittersweet. My research is not to create victims or to create the us versus them. I love America. But if we want a better nation tomorrow, we need to understand why we have the kind of mindsets that we have today around race. I think America is extremely divided on race. It's to highlight the mercurial nature of racial politics here in America. Let's go to Ireland and understand why the Irish were leaving in droves for the new country. Two groups of Irish. There was the Scots-Irish, from my understanding, and then there was the Southern Irish, who were not Protestant, and they were Catholic. They were not allowed to hold commission in the army. They couldn't own a horse that was worth more than five pounds. They weren't allowed to study law or medicine, and they couldn't speak or write Gaelic or play Irish music. The destructive consequences of the systematic oppression as the Irish were losing their civil rights, their political agency, and economic opportunities through discriminatory laws set the stage for their arrival in the United States. It's crucial to note that the British government though aimed to suppress the Irish people and their religion by creating this subordinate social class within their own country. The Great Hunger, also known as the Irish Potato Famine, was a period of extreme starvation in Ireland beginning in 1845. It was caused by a pathogen that kind of rendered the potato crop just completely inedible. The Irish were extremely dependent on potatoes. Actually, I read one source, I think, from the Library of Congress that said the average uh, Irish peasant at that time was consuming between 11 and 14 pounds of potatoes a day. The British government, a lot of which stock. ruled over Ireland at this time, neglected the crisis. They were exporting food out to England, and they were enforcing a real laissez-faire capitalism, and they were prohibiting government aid to Ireland. The head of the administration for famine relief during the Great Irish Famine was a man named Charles Trevelyan. His whole job was to administer relief during the famine. Well, here's how he viewed the famine. Quote, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. Real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, turbulent character of the You know, I'm listening to her talk about this, right? And I, I, I've gotten not a whole lot but uh, on the videos that I did of, of uh, Irish slavery and stuff like that, people are like, oh no, that is just uh, 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 people on the far right trying to uh, dilute the, uh, the slavery of the Africans that came to here to prove a point. But if you're not Irish, how could you use that? Because it's obviously they were discriminated against. And even when I was a kid, I used to hear people say that the Irish are the black people of Europe. I heard that phrase all the time, even when I was on the island. I don't know if that was a phrase in America, but I heard it back there. And uh, like the video I did where I was said I don't feel, uh, I did a storytelling video and I said like, if somebody is, is talking about their trauma, instead of then another person listening 
what they do is they start talking about their own trauma as if it's a competition. You know, oppression is oppression. It doesn't matter if it's a short person, a tall person, a black person, a white person, an Indian person, an Asian person. Oppression is oppression. Comparing with oppression is not going to, you know, make things better. It's understanding each other's struggles and possibly realizing that there's probably different degrees but, a, but you know, I hear people say it all the time, a struggle is a struggle, right? And you kind of have the same group of people controlling everything for centuries. And the only way to, to break it is not to join them and not necessarily to be completely adverse to them. So figuring out what they're doing, assimilating to a certain degree, And not becoming like them, but being yourself, but being human. The reason why the education system is bad in poor areas is because the richer people don't want their kids competing with the poor people. They want their kids to, you know, keep going. So it's the same thing with race or oppression of any people. You know what I mean? They want to control the wealth, so they're not going to let their kids become educated. It's kind of like what, what she said, where they couldn't be lawyers and they couldn't own a, 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 a horse that's more than five pounds, worth more than five pounds, you know? That's just things to keep them at a certain level. And you see that here today, if you're going to poor neighborhoods here, like where I live is one of the poorest states in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Union, the education system is jacked. And even in richer states, you go in there, in the poor sections, education system is jacked. And then some people want to do private, privatize all the schools. Who do you think is going to get the best of the best? They're not getting it now, even though they're paying taxes to get it. What's going to happen when they privatize the vibe? Let's get back to that here. The Irish people. Talking to them. Ireland's population was nearly half between the one million that died during the famine and the two million who fled the country for opportunity. Many of those refugees headed to the United States. They boarded cargo ships with little to no resources, and they were living in dark, cramped quarters, no clean water, not enough food. Disease and death were obviously rampant above what some called coffin ships, and nearly a quarter of the 85,000 passengers who left Ireland in 1847 for North America never reached their destination. In the late 18th and 19th centuries, while Britain was colonizing Ireland, the new American Republic itself was struggling to establish herself as a secure, self-sufficient nation. In 1798, the U.S. Congress passed the Alien Acts, which reflected the anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic sentiments that were just so prevalent at this time, who counted as white. African Americans were viewed as unable to be autonomous or vote responsibly in this republic. And the same kind of beliefs were also applied to European immigrants who were coming over, albeit with some differences. The characterization of European immigrants was focused primarily on character imparted by nationality and religion, whereas for African Americans, they believed that these undesirable characteristics, characteristics were innate and immutable. According to this belief, a European immigrant with poor character or the wrong religion, like a Catholic, could be possibly molded to become an American, whereas the African American could not. A Cambridge historian named Charles Kingsley wrote a letter to his wife while he was in Ireland in 1860. Charles Kingsley was a friend of Charles Darwin, which I think is pretty evident when you hear his quote describing the Irish he saw. Quote, I'm haunted by the human chimpanzees I saw along the hundred miles of horrible country. To see white chimpanzees is dreadful. If they were black, one would not see it so much. The Irish were thought to be the non-white missing link between the superior wow. European and the African. In the popular press, the Irish were depicted as subhuman. They were carriers of disease. They were drawn as lazy, clannish, unclean, drunken brawlers who wallowed in crime and bred like rats. Isn't that the same kind of vibe we hear in today about Hispanics and stuff and Africans and stuff that's coming to the country? It's the same freaking story over and over again. <laughs> wow animalistic bringing crime they come in here and they rape our women and they do this and they do that and uneducated and it's the same talking point
Most disturbingly, the Irish were Roman Catholic, and they were coming to an overwhelmingly Protestant nation, and their devotion to the Pope made their allegiance to the United States suspect. Many Irish immigrants found themselves at the bottom of the occupational ladder, taking on very dangerous and menial jobs that other workers avoided. In fact, there was a saying that I saw in the Library of Congress. It said that uh, an Irishman was buried under every tie during the dangerous constructions of the railroads. The Irish were also brought to New Orleans in large numbers to build ship canals. New Orleans was really unique because it drew heavy from um, Irish immigration because of the peculiarities of the cotton trade. So all the cotton dates that were using enslaved labor lining the Mississippi, all of that cotton was sent down river to New Orleans, where it would be loaded onto these sailing ships, and then it would be sent up to New England's textile mills. Irish peasants who were unfamiliar with American geography were often told that New Orleans was near New York, and so once they arrived in Louisiana, they could arrange travel to join their families in New York or Boston. Even though Irish labor was more expensive to hire per day than the upkeep of the cost of an enslaved person, an enslaved person represented capital to the owner. Water work was so dangerous, men would often drown or get sick and die from the diseases in the swamps. If an enslaved person drowned, an owner lost capital. If an Irish laborer died, on the other hand, the saying was, they could be replaced easily. This competition really heightened this, these class tensions, and the Irish were often antagonized by groups such as the American Protective Association and the Ku Klux Klan, who were adamantly against everything Catholic. Tensions between Protestants and Catholics found their way into these United States cities, and the verbal attacks often led, as it always does, to mob violence. During the Bible riots of 1844 in Philadelphia, mobs set fire to churches and immigrant homes, killing 13 people. Anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic sentiments in the 1840s produced groups such as the Nativist American Party, which fought foreign influences and promoted traditional American values and ideals. Doesn't this thing sound familiar, bruh? Doesn't this, oh my gosh, this thing sounds so familiar with what's happening right now. Crazy man, you're doing the same thing over and over again. Ah, I was thinking about something to say, but it just lost me there. You know the irony of it that everybody, especially when you go on Facebook page and you see them with all these memes and they saying all this stuff, and they all think it's like original thought. Every one of them think they're being original when they just regurgitated something that they heard in their childhood. You know what I mean? Uh, that, that, you see, once you hear that stuff a lot when you're younger, and it doesn't have to be, you just have to switch the group of people you're talking about, you know, so that people would be on board with you. It's crazy. American Party members earn the name the Know Nothings because their standard reply to questions about their procedures and activities was, I know nothing about it. Now, in the early 19th century, the Irish immigrants encountered African-American slaves here in America. Now, Ireland, the country, was staunchly abolitionist. They were against slavery, but Irish immigrants to America were almost universally anti-abolitionist and they supported the pro-slavery Democratic Party. Many Irish saw Abraham Lincoln for all his generous words about immigrants as a front. See, so check this out. Uh, I totally get that there. Because uh, to them, they want to be like those who are mistreating them. So then they, they're going to be against the abolition. Now let's switch it to today where you have all these Hispanic people who are like, go back to your country, come here the right way, blah, 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 to other Hispanic people. Same kind of attitude there. Different race. We ain't that different. Because the, 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 the idea of original thought is sort of passe right now, especially when it's the masses thinking something. Front man for the know nothing bigotry. This stark contrast caused tension between Irish kin groups in America and those who were still in Ireland back home, highlighting this commodification of American whiteness. Daniel O'Connell, who was a prominent Irish figure who fought against British colonial oppression in Ireland, condemned the Irish-American support of slavery, but he was met with rejection. The issue of slavery was so divisive that it caused hostility among a people who were once united in their desire for Irish independence from Britain. I think the powder cake moment 
is the conscription act of 1863. And it just exacerbated these tense relationships because this act made white men between the ages of 20 and 45 years old eligible for draft by the Union Army. But African-American men were not drafted or otherwise forced to fight. White men with money could bribe doctors for medical exemptions, legally hire a substitute, or get out of it some other way. Still happening today. <laughs> Still happening today, boy. A lot of those people who run for office and stuff like that, they boast about their kids going off to war, but they don't. They don't. They don't. Rich men are paying off doctors and stuff to say they have shin splints. <laughs> Listen, I'm not right. I'm not left. I'm just pointing out what they're doing. And I'm quite sure that on both sides of the spectrum, them rich people are doing that. You know what I mean? Where I live, send off the most people to war per capita in this country. And it's one of the less fortunate states in the country. Wink, wink. <laughs> but those who were less affluent couldn't afford to pay for deferments. And the, in the inequities of the draft eligibility between the African Americans, the moneyed whites, and the working class whites, many who were Irish American, increased racial tensions. In July of that year, a mob protesting the draft formed in New York, and the riots that followed destroyed entire blocks of businesses and homes. Now, several cities suffered draft riots as well, but New York City experienced the largest incident. More than 100 people were murdered by the angry mob, which was burning down the draft office, killing police officers and well-dressed whites, and killing African-American bystanders, and African-American residents beaten or lynched. The riot involved white workers, many including Irish Americans. The riots continued for two more days, but Union soldiers and regiments eventually brought an end to the violence, and I actually... I, I'd have to check, but I think President Lincoln actually had to call uh, troops from Gettysburg to come suppress these riots. And a pamphlet... That you know, I'm sitting here thinking, so I understand why the big deal about John F. Kennedy becoming president when he did become president, Irish Catholic. And I remember them, I was raised Catholic, so I remember the big deal about that when I started to learn more about Kennedy because I was too small to remember him being president. But... Uh, I was always, what's the big deal? But now I know they had all of this going on. That was published after President Lincoln's election. The authors made some truly reprehensible claims um, of the Irish, labeling them as, quote, inferior to other white Americans, and that they were, quote, more brutal than African Americans. In 1864, this pamphlet, the Miscegenation Manifesto, it's called The Theory of the Blending of Races, was published, which it claimed that interracial marriages would ensure the curve between African Americans and Irish Americans. The manifesto was a hoax cooked up by two Democratic journalists who were seeking to discredit the um, Republican President Abraham Lincoln as a, quote, race mixer. The hoaxers, <laughs> one of them who was born in Ireland and was a member of a Protestant religious sect, made a special play on the race marginalization of the Irish. They hoped to mobilize the Irish vote against Lincoln by exploiting this deep-seated fear the Irish had of losing their place in America's racial hierarchy. Pamphlet attempted to use language of social science to justify these claims in an attempt to impugn the Irish, even talking about the, the skull of the Irish and compared to other European groups. Now, the Irish have been repeatedly denounced during the Civil War era as inferior to other white Americans, and the pamphlet had flatly said, quote, the Irishman was, quote, originally of a colored race, a more brutal race, and lower in civilization than the Negro. Uh, well, you know, you, 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 that's pure political, because if somebody comes from an oppressed race, they're a little bit more brutal when you think about it, because they have to be brutal in order to be heard. I'm not saying it's justified or, you know, the, for lack of a better term and thing. But, you know, when, you, when you're getting oppressed and you, you, you keep trying to, to, to negotiate and talk to people and they're still saying, well, you're not better than me, then you're going to resort to brutality. And even if you join the side that was uh, oppressing you, you're going to brutally oppress somebody else who is being oppressed. But that doesn't have to do anything with race per se. That has everything to do with history. The history that was taught to them of how their forefathers were treated. 
and that's that could last for a century. I mean, we see we seen it now. That that stuff, that kind of feeling, could last for centuries. Unquote. It's important to note that this pamphlet was not an isolated incident, but just a larger pattern of the powers that be trying to pit groups against each other along racial lines. It's worth remembering, too, that many states had laws in place up until the 20th century that banned inter interracial marriages. I've actually never found a legal marriage license for my great-grandfather, John Donnelly, and my great-grandmother, Lola Perot. The No Irish Need Apply signs and advertisements and songs provide evidence of the discrimination and prejudice faced by the Irish in America. A Chicago Tribune published this piece in 1855, quote, Who does not know that the most depraved, debased, worthless, and irredeemable drunkards and sots which curse the community are the Irish Catholics, unquote. The historical context prompts the question, how did the Irish, once viewed as non-white, become white in the United States? This is not to create a new group of victims and say, look how, look how bad America treated the Irish, look how bad America treated all of these different groups, but to take a step back and be like, are we, are we repeating this over and over again? Are we falling into these, this racial ploy of seeing each other in these binary groups? Well, some, some historians say that the Irish leveraged their political power and assimilated into American society, particularly using civil service jobs. For instance, at the outset of the first wave of Irish immigration in 1840, there were very few Irish police officers in New York City. However, by the end of that year, Irish officers constituted over a quarter of the police force. And by the end of the century, over half of the city's police officers and more than 75% of the firefighters were Irish. Additionally, prosecutors, judges, prison guards, and other civil service jobs. According to historian Matthew Fry Jacobson, this allowed the Irish to become a visible part of American society, occupying positions of power and contributing to the public good as civil servants. This increase in representation allowed Irish Americans to portray themselves as patriotic, as selfless civil servants, which was a marked shift from their earlier characterization as uncivilized barbarians. It's notable that now, the annual St. Patrick's Day parades in many cities celebrate police and fire departments reflecting this historical trend. No longer embedded in the lowest rung of American society, some Irish unfortunately gained acceptance in the mainstream by dishing out some of the same bigotry towards newcomers that they had experienced. County Cork native and working men party leader Dan You know, over the years there's been a lot of light-skinned blacks that did the same thing. They did the same bloody thing. All in the name of fitting in and, you know, being part of stuff. It's happening as we speak. <laughs> Even real dark-skinned African-Americans are, are joining those who have disparaging things to say of other African-Americans. I could name some names, but I'm not going to because I ain't getting in that vibe. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Dennis Kearney, for example, closed his speeches to American laborers with his rhetorical signature, quote, whatever happens, the Chinese must go, unquote. Kearney was a California labor leader from Ireland who was active in the late 19th century and he was known for his anti-Chinese activism. Kearney and his compatriots overlooked the moral of their own narrative. While the Irish did leave a significant mark on the United States, the reverse was also true. The anxieties of the nativists did not materialize and instead the influx of the Irish Immigrants and their descendants has bolstered the country. We're better for it. Presently, I think 32 million Americans trace lineage to Ireland, including myself. And the once scorned Irish are now celebrated on St. Patrick's Day, a day when everyone is Irish. And I wanted to end with a quote that I found. It was an interview with an Irish American man a couple years ago. Um, his family came over from Ireland, but he was born here. And he explains in the interview about his family. Uh, not really identifying as Irish. His grandmother and mom, he said, really wouldn't give him any um, information about his, his Irish ancestry. And this is what he said, quote, they said, that's not important, we're Americans. I, with my mother and grandmother, had a fairly heavy Irish dialect, and I worked very hard to get rid of it. And I'm sorry I did it. You want to fit in. They never talked about being Irish. The history of Irish immigration in the United States serves as a reminder of the power of immigration to transform both the immigrant and the hosting society. Like I've said before, this is not about 
pointing fingers and saying, or, or, or looking to also get a victim card. I think this is about looking uh, to the past and saying, we've seen these patterns over and over and over again. And if we don't recognize them as patterns, we're doomed to repeat them. As a proud American of multi-ethnic background, to kind of look at this question dead on and say, who gets to count as American and how has that changed over time and why? Quite, quite interesting. You know what I'm saying? That, that was quite interesting. But you know, it was kind of easier for them to assimilate because of the color of the skin. And that's not to say, this is no victim thing here. It's just, it's just that way. It's easier to pick out uh, somebody that's Asian in the crowd or black in the crowd or even like Let's say somebody come to my country. My country is like what, eighty something percent, ninety percent, black people. Yeah, of course, you would see a white person walking through the the, the, the sea of uh, black people. You understand what I mean? So it's easy to, it's easier to discriminate against somebody that you could see coming. Whereas you, you, you wouldn't see an Irish man coming. You know, not in not today. Back in the day, they probably would. But there's just like she said, there's just so many different ethnic groupings in herself now that uh, you really can't tell the difference per se anymore. And that goes to some things I usually say in these uh, reactions to history. Who is pure? You don't know. With the coming and the going, the trading, the interracial, the mixing, and people are like, we are pure this year. Nobody's pure. You're pure human, that's for sure. That's for sure, you're pure human. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'll leave a link in the description so you can go check this video out. Kings and generals. Uh, well, no, 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 no. This is not king. What am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, go check out. I don't know. This is the only video I've seen of this uh, young lady here. So, you know what I mean? But it's a very poignant statements in here. Very poignant. So, go check out her channel. Also, uh, I'll leave links in here that we talk about specifically to this kind of a subject. I'll leave a link so you could go check it out and tell you, tell you, tell you, you understand what I'm going to say? And uh, hey, if you like this video, comment down below. And if you subscribe, or you have subscribed, make sure you hit the notification bell so you know when I'm putting out videos. Because I've got them storytelling videos coming out too now. You know, I'm doing a little different thing and thing on there, you understand what I'm going to say? Y'all take care of each other, alright? Cool runnings.